Okay, hi everyone. So today we're going to touch on structured and non-structured, uh, structured and unstructured data. <coughs> so while you're still picking up pandas for your assignment two, uh, this is a bit of intersection to what you've been learning. The reason for learning about structured and unstructured data is sometimes you need to access them. So in an organization, it's fairly common that there's some kind of database system existing. So other than your data sources in CSV or Excel, sometimes you need to access them on Microsoft Access or MySQL in this case, or even from a no SQL system. So today we're going to run through two types of database systems. One is a MySQL, a relational database, and the second is a no SQL, non-relational structured database. So if you, you might probably spend more time installing or struggling to install than actually doing than using it uh. so this is a for for warning okay so if you could um because it's better to work on your laptop to run it locally rather than off the cloud the cloud, the cloud is a bit slow sometimes so i need you to install uh mi scale first uh, while you're installing that start talking so if you can skip to yeah go to slide 17, where it gives you instructions to install the community edition, go ahead and click on the link and install first. Right? So, depending on the Mac user or uh, Windows user, you choose your OS and uh, the, the, the 32 or 64 piece system you're running, then download and install. You need two things to run this one is the MISQL server. Okay. So, when you run this installer, oops. So, when you run this installer, 
you start, look, you look something like this, this is the launcher. And then at the beginning, it will tell you, oh, you have all, these are the stuff that, that you have or you don't have. So if you never install any of these products or software before, you know, this will be very empty. Just need to click on add and you need to choose the server to install. Now, there's no um, difference between choosing the 8 or 5.7. I think the main difference is a lot of systems out there use the 5.7 version. Uh, if you want, you can use the 8. Okay, so there are some my there are some differences, but generally it doesn't really affect you much. Now the second thing you need to install from that will be under the applications called the workbench. So the workbench is a tool, a GUI tool for you to access the database server. Okay, so that's the second thing we install. Okay. Um yeah. You probably might need to also install this um, connector. So the connector is a driver for your Python script to connect to MySQL. So you should put this, you should install the Python uh, connector for based on your current Python version that's set up in your system. So if you're using Python 3.7, you should take the first option here. If you're using Python 2.7, then you should take the version of 2.7. Okay. So this is the first thing you need to install. Then later on, halfway through after the break, then we'll install your NoSQL database. Okay, so while you follow the link to install the stuff, I'll just talk through this dealing about databases. Okay. Um, has anyone here used a database before? Like MISQL relational databases? Anyone? Experience? No. Nobody used uh, any of this kind of database before. Okay, so I just need to explain to you what the relational database actually works, how it works. So in database technologies, there are two main branches of database, database technologies available. One is called the SQL and the other is no SQL. Relational and non-relational databases. So relational databases are kind of like, so we will Many we call them structured databases. So structured databases means you can create relations. In relations meaning uh, one to many. For example, a student has many uh, courses they're attending, or a person has many address, has many friends, you know, Facebook, that kind of thing. So when we have relations that can be established between data, we can actually put them under a relational database like SQL systems. Now there are a lot of products or software that follow this convention of uh, collecting data under the SQL branch. Things like MySQL, the one you're going to install, Oracle, SQL Server, Postgres, and a lot of these uh, systems available. Now the other branch of databases um, taught is this thing called NoSQL. NoSQL only emerged about a few years ago when there was a need to create a database that had highly complex structures. Or in a sense, it's largely non-structured. So, it's kind of a bit empty um, definition, and it, uh, a bit contradicting. So it, in, I mean, the site talk about non-structured, right? But actually, I would like to refer that as a different kind of structure if you look at non relational databases. So if you look at the next slide on comparison of a relational and non-relational database, so the relational database, in the sense, um, on the left-hand side, look very much like your Excel spreadsheets, a very tabular type of format. So an easy way to, a easy way to visualize a relational versus non-relational is when you think of relational, very, very often it comes in tables, tabular format of structured data. It's, it's constrained by columns, and then between each table, certain relations. Now in the so-called non-relational database, I wouldn't call it non-structured. Huh? It's actually highly structured. Um, a good example would be this thing on the right hand side, which is called a JSON document. Uh, who has a who has who knows the meaning of JSON? JSON. If you don't understand what JSON means, right? And you just call it JSON, 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 like someone's name with that. Okay, so basically JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. So JavaScript Object Notation is a way of defining an object using uh, JavaScript language or the JavaScript syntax. So if you do, you've seen this thing before on the right hand side, okay, this is the type of structure, 
that is condensed in a single document. We normally call those, this thing, this piece of information, a document, rather than what we have on the left hand side, which is all tables. So this is a very distinct difference, tables and documents, this is how I look at it. Now in the relational database, you can have many tables that could be interlinked with each other through relations. And on the right hand side, you could have a single document that encompasses all these relations in, in one single structure of the information. But, they, but the same information can actually be represented in either way. So, taking this example, users, user skills, user experience, a lot like, like C or CD, right? So you have some skills, you have some experience. Now you can organize the information in a relational database through tables, or you can put it together as a document and in a non-SQL or non-relational database. So the same information actually can be represented in two different forms. So here is another example of relations and non-relational. So if you understand how your Facebook or uh, Twitter works, right? When you post something, you can you as a single person can post many articles, right? Or you can put a post and every post could have many comments from different people. So when you have this kind of a one item, one piece of information can be linked to multiple pieces of information like this. A post can have many comments. That's an established all kind of relation. We call them one to many relations. So there's there's essentially three type of relations you can establish with the information. One to one, one to many, many to many. The many, many, many to many relation is the most complicated one uh, type of organization. It tends to be very hard to read through. Then in the non-relational SQL system, which is on the right hand side, what we have is not two separate information, but the two separate information is put together as one thing we call posts in this case. So your post has many comments. So instead of separating the two pieces of information as two different uh, structures or tables, you actually put them together like this in the post. So one post, a title, and then multiple comments. And then post, and then the next post and such. So when you look at relational and non-relational, the key aspect is separation and compression. So in non-relational, you compress everything together in one document. So you get a, you get to see like a first eye view picture of the information. In a non in a relation database, when you look at one table, often you don't get to see the whole picture because there are all these hidden or very Define relations, but you don't actually see them as one whole thing. This example here is a JSON or JSON structure. So the JSON structure is very easy to look at uh, and very easy to identify. Anytime you see this curly brace, braces, and maybe sometimes in between the square brackets and stuff like right? that's just a JSON type of notation. So, <clears throat> so let me write you some JSON stuff. So this is all right. This is a JSON object. Open curly brace, close curly brace. Literally object, but with nothing inside, right? So starting with non with a non-relational and non-scale database first. This itself is a single JSON document. So JSON JSON notation has certain rules. Like if you're talking about an object, a singular object, like a cell, you always have a curly brace beginning and a closing curly brace. This thing in between, which defines what information this cell or this uh, object carries, is called a key. Followed by the, co the colon and then a value. Now, key and values, every key always is always surrounded by the double quote. And the value can either be a double quote like this or a number with decimals. So, as simple as a JSON object, uh, JSON notation or object notation is in the structured document tries to, tries to define or describe an object. It's very simple in the terms that it comes to the value, there are only two ways of looking at it. It's either like this, in a double quote, we call it a string or text, or a number format. It can be a decimal sign integer or regular, uh, uh, yeah, decimal sign or integer. So with decimal places or no decimal places, with a sign in front. So either these two. 
So this is the basic, think of it as a basic cell, like a basic object. Now a JSON, JSON representation can also be a list. Just like you look at a list in your Python, you create a list to handle, to do certain things. Now the JSON way of describing a list will use the square notation, the square bracket, the starting opening square bracket and the closing square bracket. Within this list, you can either have numbers, just like in Python, or letters, or strings, because strings, of course. Now, between these two rules of creating two types of objects, a singular object and a list, you can combine them and then create a more complicated JSON object. that has a list inside the JSON object and values there. And in the list itself, it can even expand to not just have simple values like a string, but complex values like this. So following the basic rules of creating a single object or a list in JSON, you can actually expand this into a far more complex object. So in NoSQL, the power of NoSQL or non-relation databases is they let you define the object structure in one single document. So if you take if I take this 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 content structure, so at one look I can tell that I have these properties, it has a list inside, it has a list of friends, and each friend object has this certain properties and keys and properties. Now if I were to take this and convert into a relational database, what happens? It's like taking a animal and splitting it apart. A bit, okay, maybe more really, okay. So if you're taking a car and splitting it apart, wheels go one side, chairs go one places, the cover goes to another place, the engine goes to another, another box. So if I take this fairly, little bit of a complex object and turn it around and say now I'm going to make it this into a relational database SQL style right how do I represent it well maybe I'll have a table right that looks like this so this is my first table okay, I'm gonna be a little bit uh, old-fashioned huh? like putting this like so. So this is my first table. This is my second table. And then I have another table. Actually I won't have another table. I won't have, I may not have another table here. Let me just plant this person over here. So, technically from this structure, I should probably have three tables to make sense of it. Okay. So what are the three tables here? Now there's a table of names that, ha that contains Melvin, Cheryl, and Matt. Okay. That's small piece. And there's a table of telephone numbers. But there's also something else that we can't see from that we see from here that's that needs to be created in the so-called relational tables uh, databases. A relation between Melvin to the telephones and a relation between Melvin here to his friends. So how do we define that? So Often or not, this thing in relational in relational databases or your tables, your worksheets, right? We have this thing idea of this concept of ID. Unique identifiers, we call them. So every row is considered in a table has to be unique, has to have a identifier that uniquely sets it apart from the rest of the data. Why? Now, the general rule that you can that you any time you can refer to a single row in the table by using this unique key. Either a single key or a combination of keys, we call it composite keys. 
So in a sense, I have this basic table, ID and name. And eventually later for telephones, I might also have that kind of in its own indexing system or the ID system. Now in the friends table here, I want to create a relation between firstly Melvin here and this telephone numbers. Like I need to find a way to say these numbers belong to this person here. Right? So maybe user. Okay, so the table name we can call it user telephones. So user ID and telephone ID. Now you begin to see the structure take place here. Melvin would have one and one and two. So this table here called user telephones define relationship between Melvin and the telephones. This is one way of looking at the relations. Another way that can define the relations, assuming the telephones are unique to Melvin, is to do this by adding one more column and saying that this belongs to him. So if you follow me now, Melvin has an ID of unique identifier of one. And between these two tables, I create a relationship between this row and these two rows through this column user ID. So this creates a relation between him and the telephone numbers. Now next, what about him and the friends? So you know in Facebook, you can have shared friends, right? Mutual friends or mutual connections. So if you look at that, you think about that kind of relationship. Cheryl can be a friend of someone else as well. Not just Cheryl doesn't actually have only one friend who is Melvin. So in this concept, we have a many-to-many -many relationship. Or a linkage between him, Melvin the one, user ID one, to Cheryl and user ID one Melvin here. So Matt. So this table here, which contains nothing but references, indexes, cross a relation between the row inside here to the within the rows, in between the rows of this table. So Melvin here to Cheryl, Melvin here to Matt. Let me split this. Can I split this table? easier to see now. So on the right left hand side is my it's also called non-relational data, a document in JSON. At one glance you can see what information this has. On the right hand side is your relational tables. Each set here with the double line that I created is a table. So a table will be like when you handle in Python you need a CSV file. Right? The CSV file contains name ID like this. Or another CSV file contains telephone number and user ID. And one more CSV file contains relations. So the difference, the, the experience you get from looking at these two information is that when you look at a singular table like here, you don't actually get a full picture until, until you realize what the relation between this table to the other tables in the relational database. Whereas in a structure, in a non-structured also got no relational database in the document. At one glance, you can see everything. Now, because if this table, this friends list is hundreds and thousands of items long, uh, it will still be difficult to look at it. it uh, look at it through so notepad interface. So that, that's why we have certain GUI and command tools that you can query the information that comes in this format or stored in this format, as well as in this format. So the first format that we need you to familiarize with will be the one on the right hand side, relational databases. Now, if every ta every piece of table here or every table here was to belong to a particular worksheet in your Excel, or if you had not access before an ta actual table, how do you query the information? So in Excel, you have things like, you can do things like filter, search, and such, right? <coughs> Yeah. 
Okay. So Excel is a very table kind of layout structure, right? Very similar to how these things work out. But one thing that Excel doesn't really have, you, if you, you use it for some time, it, it doesn't create relations between worksheets. Oh, you can actually create some of that by right, using your VLOOKUPs and stuff like, and, and tools, but it doesn't answer the, the question of making creating strong relationships. So if you have a table it, like this, or you, it, in, if you really type pandas and numpy right, to read CSV files, typically it is a CSV file, read it, it goes in the data frame, you can do a bit of filtering and stuff. How do you do this for a SQL system? So in the SQL system, what we have is typically this thing called SQL, uh, secret relational database, so that kind of thing. It's called SQL. So SQL basically stands for sequential query language. The purpose of SQL is a set of language syntax that allows you to query a database, a relational database. Now you cannot use SQL on a non-relational database. Uh, because it works totally, it works in a very different way. So a sequential query language allows you to query things in in a SQL Server. Now one of the tools that you're installing, if you're done with your SQL Server, is this thing called MySQL Workbench. So MySQL Workbench is particularly designed to work on the MySQL Server. So if you have a local MySQL Server, and you, for me, I have had some working stuff, so I created like connections to, to my databases. So in essence, right, when you look at the database, I'll show you what the interface looks like. So on the left hand side are my so-called the databases that I have in uh, running on my laptop. Uh, they exist in an iconic way of a cylinder. Okay, that's because old days of databases used to be literally hard drives where you put information in there. So this icon never goes away. So the structure in the SQL Databases starts this thing starts with this thing called a schema. Many have two things though, two two things to focus on. Now there are others because of the feature of SQL. You need to understand what is a schema and what is what are tables. Now the schema is basically like a collection of a table. Every schema contains more, can contain up to as many tables you want to create. Uh, as far as your disk space is concerned, how much you can use. Okay. And every every table you create has a column has a concept of columns and finally rows. Similar to data frames, data frames you also have columns and rows. So when you look at data frames, you think of tables in SQL. It's closest to what you have done in data frames inside a two two n dimensional two dimensional arrays. So in order to access all this, up to creation of all this thing, you need SQL to do it. So I'm going to, let me see if I can make my screen bigger, but it's very small. Those at the back, you have to tell me, can you see this or not? See, can you see? If you cannot, move, move in front. Right. Uh, so I'm going to take an uh, example of some projects I was working on before. Okay, so I have this cylinder on left hand side called marketplace. So the concept of databases is the organization is you have to start with a schema, which is a container of tables. And this container of tables will contain table will have tables that you need for an application. Now for you as a data analyst, you're gonna do the do, do work like that. You will be accessing tables or schemas generated by your database administrator. So where they get the data from, you can question ask them like they could get it from analytics, get it from their own uh, data event logging systems. But so for somewhere out there, they're gonna put it in a schema like this for you. Or they're gonna tell you, oh, you need data, come to this schema, I'll give you some connection stream to access. So that's how it works out. So for you, your role is to understand what is a SQL, what is a relation database, what are the terminologies associated how to access it and how to get data out. So you need to understand the schema is the top tier, the toughest level of organization of, data, of a relational database. 
followed by tables. So in my table, in my schema here called the marketplace, I have five tables, categories, chat messages, offers, product users. Let's say assuming I'm running this thing called carous like carousel, like okay? I do all the marketplace transactions. And your data analyst and you need to pull out some information for me to re re do some insights and reports. So maybe you need access to the database. So as the DB administrator, I'll say, okay, here's the connection string, which is like, uh, normally it comes in a, in the form of a host. So sounds like a crash landing you into a job. Uh. So if I'm a DB admin, right, you need data from me, I'll tell you, oh, here's the connection string of the data you need. Well, it will look like this. Um, maybe it's a IP in the company systems, right? And followed by, oh, actually no, like this, okay. So this is the first part of the collection stream. Then I'll give you the username. Maybe username is data, data, data user, password is something like that. Like that. So to give you, the DBME will give you three pieces of information. What's the host schema to connect to? They the username and password. Now they will set up a user uh, a user account for you such that usually you only have read access. That means you cannot modify data inside. Okay. So sometimes it may give you write access, but maybe it's a siloed database that you can actually pull data, like read data from somewhere, push data back to the DB. So like one of your assignment requirements is you must be able to read data from a SQL server and then save it in the SQL server. So if you're given like write access, you can do the saving. So this will be something like the information that it gives you. So with this information, you need to probably go to Workbench, if you have a UI, and key in the host, which is your, in this case, maybe my host is local host, or the IP address. So this IP address or this host part, right, can be the 4-digit IP, IPv4 format, or it can be a name of the PC or system. Maybe DB something like that. So even a host name, domain name also is also valid. So this thing will go into the host name part. Okay. Port. The port is something that the database uses to communicate with other systems outside. Every time you install a database server, you will naturally be using a, a unique port. Which means that you cannot have two databases sharing the same port. Okay? Then followed by the username, which is what the DBM will give you, and the password. So you can connect your database using like a tool like MLS Workbench. Sometimes you don't have, then you can do it through the command line. So let's say assuming you're going to get in, right? You'll see something like this. On the left hand side, cylinders that represent the schema, and when you expand the cylinder, tables that represent the info actual information that you want to extract. So every table in the MSQL has this thing called columns. Now, of course, you see in the example here a bit more, like column indexes, foreign key triggers. Well, your concern will be when you're working in data is importantly columns and maybe some like indexes. Okay, so let's look at the columns itself. Now, if you expand on the columns, you will notice what you have there will be basically, if you imagine reading a CSV file, the different columns in your data file. So in this case, there are two columns in the categories table. If I look at the chat messages, there are more columns there. So the more columns available in the data in the table means you have more information you can extract. So you need to probably understand how do you pull out the information from this. So what I just did is to open a tab. So what MS Global Bank gives you a very a tabular interface that you can create. You can create tabs and you can write your query languages or your syntax in the in the middle here like notepad. So when you're working with the MySQL database, I think first thing is how what is how do you use SQL to access it? So what I can do now is to go through, run through the different syntaxes in SQL, the basic ones, and I think in the slides there's also definitely the section on that. On the use it. Yeah. So run structure. Yeah. This is from here. Super privileges. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm going to start with the read, some of the reading capabilities, then I'll move on to the creation. So if you have, let's say, something like this, I have a tables, categories table, or let me just look at chat messages table, right? How do I want to extract information from chat messages? So there are basically for data reading and manipulation, there are four main kind, four key words that you need to remember. So when handling data, uh, think of CRUD, C -R -U -D, creation, retrieval, update, delete. Four basic operations of information. You can create data, you can retrieve data, update the data, and delete data. For each operation, there is equivalent SQL syntax to use. So to retrieve data, we use this keyword called select. So select is a keyword that allows you to pull information and not just the row of information or all the information from a table, you can actually choose what you want to extract. So choosing what you extract comes in so it gives you uh, the two ways to choose what you want to extract. One, you choose by criteria. That means you have certain, certain conditions to fulfill. So it's similar to how you do Boolean indexing in your data frames or your n-dimensional arrays in, pen, in Python. You said, I want to maybe retrieve rainfall that's more than 500 millimeters or something like that. So those are conditions. In SQL, you also can, in, you can also specify these conditions to choose what you want to extract. The next thing you can pull out it's also similar with the data frames. Sometimes you only need those few columns, right? You don't need everything. So we call them as well projections. So you can also say, I don't want everything in the table. I only want these two columns. So I project the column that I want to extract. Now the most basic SQL selection command, retrieval command is to retrieve everything from the table. How do you do that? Now introducing you another thing called wildcard, which is the asterisk. The asterisk, when any programming languages like the question mark or sometimes the percentage, it's a kind of wall card. So when I specify a percent of asterisk here, it means I want to project all the columns in the table. So it's a shortcut. Instead of specifying all the columns, I put an asterisk there. The second keyword that I use is from to tell SQL what table am I retrieving from. Then followed by the table name. Now in the table name here, in this is something is a uh, this is something that you may or may not follow, but it's a guideline. So sometimes when I write, as a developer myself, when I write SQL commands, right, I skip out this little um, this uh, little quote at the sides. I just immediately name the table out like that. Okay. Now this works uh, for most cases, but if you're writing inside the uh, SQL like a query tab like this or command line, sometimes you may may be better to specify the table name using this uh, to this uh, standard quote. So I don't know what to call this code. It's, it's below your tilde on top of your tab on the your keyboard. You notice that there's a single the code that started. Okay. If you're using Workbench, it helps you to also look at the syntax because it uh it auto colors the certain things. Like some people notice the keywords, right? Are always colored in blue. Okay. So for now you type something and in blue color, you know it's a keyword. And if you the moment you use this code right around it, it colors the text in army green or some kind of dark green, dirty green, right? So this is my first basic statement to, that I need to understand with uh, use with SQL, which is I select all the information from a particular table called chat messages. Now in the workbench, you can run this command by clicking on the lightning or execute icon on the top. Now you notice there are two execute icons. One is a simple lightning, lightning icon. The other is a lightning icon with a cursor. If you mouse over the individual icon, actually there will be a tool tip that tells you what it means. So if I want to execute everything in this window, I just click on the lightning icon here. If I want to execute, execute the line that only, then I click on the second one with the cursor. So by writing this SQL command, the result will be displayed below in your workbench, which is a tabular, a table-like format that you see that you're familiar with in Excel or you print out your data frames. So this is similar with we add CSV a file and then print out the data frame, right? You get all the columns and all the rows. The difference here is that in a data frame, if you don't specify the index column, you'll generate an index 0 to one number number. Okay, but here there's no concept of index column in that in the same in the same way that you have data frames. The index column in this case was already predefined when it created a table called chat messages. So you don't have an explicit index here. Now how do you know 
where is my index column, right? Or the ID that so called that needs to be there. Now, if I go to the table and do an auto table to see the view the properties of the table, right? So this analysis workbench also lets you see the table properties and every column, what the column, what kind of data the column will contain, and what kind of property the column has. So in this case, there doesn't, there is no primary key or index column defined. So I'm going to relate the index column in data frame similarly to this thing called primary key in databases. So you think about primary, we will hear primary keys, right? What's a primary key? Well, think of it as an index column, something that uniquely identifies every column in your in the table structure data. Here also, every column has a data type. So if you remember data types in your data frame, when you read a CSV file, or when you do a NumPy gen from text or load text, you can specify every column data type. Is this a number? Is it a unicode? string is it a float right same concept can apply also applies in MISQL every column here has a data type that you can assign now this data type would have been either created or designed by the database designer someone who set up the database or eventually you can create a database like this so when you need when you decide what kind of data type you want to use a column the factors to determine that will be what makes what, what is enough to contain the data it means if you allocate enough space for it, okay, and is it practical? For example, in messages here, uh, bar char here basically means similar to your U. So if you're doing D, your D type in Python, in, in, in Python right, U255 will be similar to bar char 255. means a string of unicodes or text 255 characters long. Okay, so the space allocated for this column is 255. Anything more than that will get to be kind of lost or truncated. So when you define data types, right, for every column, you need to pay attention to those. So later I will, I'll, later I will show you the creation of the table and some of the commands related to that. So now we just see and read only first. Okay. So this is your basic selection command. Select everything from chat messages. Now how do you then incorporate criteria? So you know you can do Boolean indexing in data frames or your arrays and lists, right? How do you do it here? So instead of doing Boolean indexing, you introduce one more here called the where, where keyword. Now the where keyword basically lets you start starts joining SQL conditions. Conditions like too big. For example, I want to look for where buyer ID is equal to 3. So this itself is a condition. Now by ID here, the by ID refers to a column. So the idea between the idea of conditions or criteria we call them as here, right, is to specify what are the condition criteria I want it to re retrieve my information from this table. Now conditions here can be single conditions or combination of conditions. So let's say I have to run this basic select star from chat messages where buyer ID is three. You can see visually that where the buyer ID is from. These three rows will be reflected later. So I run this command. You can see that it will only retrieve the three rows based on my single criteria here. Now if I want to expand the criteria, like combine more criteria, it's very common when you're expecting a lot of data. You can, you can introduce these keywords or these logical operators so if you go back to your basic pattern, you have logical operators, right? Similarly to logical operators, you can also use things like the all and n. So the all and n conditions are your logical operators. You learn in Python, you can apply here also. So I can specify all criteria to say, hey, all. So if I want to choose maybe buyer IDs that come from, come from, I want to choose two different buyer IDs, right? can do this. So here we give me the buy IDs 3 and 2. Or 3 or 2. Lah, okay? Now if you use the end keyword, you know the problem, right? Is that if you try to, risk, to ask the criteria like this, buy ID equal 3 and buy ID equal 2. Okay? SQL will not be able to return you any result because a single buy ID cannot exist, cannot have 
two values. So when you're using the logic operators, you also have to bear in mind what makes sense, right? You cannot have a single field belonging to uh, either of these two values, values expressed in this kind of criteria. So you better say, I want to find those equal to either 3 or 2 and use the all condition. Now, other than limited to one column, you can also use other columns to state your criteria. Example, message. The message column here actually contains text. Okay, so can you use a message to find matching information? So yes, you can. So now I'll find whereby ID is equal to or the message says hello. So notice that the message says hello says hello has come out here or as well as the by ID equals to two over here. So criteria can be combined with other colors. Now for text in MISQL, you can also expand the kind of comparison. Having a simple comparison of equivalence equal, it may be very limited. For example, if you want to just look for uh, in, in part of a text, just like Google search. In Google search, you don't need to type out the entire title to match it. You just need part of the title. So maybe I want to look for people who say, ask for discounts. Okay. Now, do I use an equal sign? No. In MISQL, there is another keyword that allows you to do partial text matching using the like keyword. So it's like saying, oh, it's like, it's like having, having it's like having, it, it's, it has a, this is like a bit of red, a bit of blue, you know, that kind of uh, meaning. Now when you use a like keyword, it tells SQL to say, do a partial matching. Now the, the like keyword does a partial matching, however, usually it needs something else. So I'm going to maybe just run this selection here. So I'm gonna look for something else on this one. Take out this one. Okay, so I'm gonna look for by ID two and I'm gonna look for someone that says seller. Okay. So I'm gonna look for this particular row. Yes, I'm the seller. Someone who mentions the word seller. Okay. Now if you just do a like seller, it doesn't match. So when you ever we use a text matching like this keyword like. We have to combine it with a wildcard. So the wildcard basically in, in the text, right, like this percent sign, allows you to say something like, oh, it's, it literally allows you to say, oh, the message contains the word seller by having this in there. So the wildcard on both sides means that, oh, I don't care about what's the text on the left and the right of this word. I just care that it contains this word inside. All this text is in there. Yep, so you fish it actually retrieves two of this that contains the word seller. Now if I want to say can I find something that starts with the word seller and then something else, I remove the wildcard in front to say that oh it starts with this word and it continues with something else. So this part is like I don't care what's behind as long as it starts with the word seller. So now this particular row is retrieved. The one we start with the word seller. So the like key, the like keyword here allows you to do very simple text matching. Contains, begin, ending with. <coughs> now, the next part of our selection is how do you then choose the columns you want? So you can use I lock or lock to retrieve from data frames, right? All the rows followed by the columns you want. But in MSQL, you need to specify the name of the column. So let's say I only need two columns, which is the message and date set. So how do we retrieve the columns that we want from this table? So instead of using the asterisk which says retrieve me all the columns, I specify the name of the column followed by the comma and the next name of the column itself. So between every name and the comma, the column I set, I need to put in a comma sign. So this statement will retrieve me two columns from the chat messages table. Okay. 
So this is more or less the basic of a selection statement. So very simple selection statement from one table itself. The next kind of statement, so we did retrieval, the next kind of statement I will show you will be the updating statement. How do you update information in the table? So to update information in a table, example in chat messages, what I can do, or maybe I'll use the products instead. So let's take a look at products. This is a table for the product in my sample database. Contains name, price, images, description, view type, and stuff like that. Okay. <clears throat> so if I want to do an update, updating something here, how do I do it? So example, let's say the first item, a BTS cap, I want to change the name to something else. So the keyword to use in SQL will be this for update. Oh, by the way, lowercase and uppercase doesn't matter. I can do mixed case, it still works. Okay, so the keyword, this in this keywords in SQL, they're recognized by the word itself, regardless of the, the uh, case. So update statement, simple like, simple like select, right? So what am I going to do? What, so think of what am I doing first. Oh, now, now select, I'm going to update, not change information. So update, but update what? Or update which table? Update products. So when you're updating, you update what? Products. And what, I'm going to, what am I going to change? Which column am I going, am I going to change? I'm going to change the name col col column. So it's a set. Change it to what? Uh, I'm going to change this name common to just say uh, another regular cat. So this is a update. This is a com more or less complete update statement, but missing one very important thing. So when we update a table and say I updating, I'm gonna update the product table. In this case, set the name to this new value. So we're going to literally override the value name. Okay, if I just run this command, what's gonna happen disastrously is that every name column, uh, in fact every name field here in the table all be changed to this single value. The reason is because I never specified a condition. So when you're updating information database, especially in a relation database, you always need you always specify the condition by in the where the where queue. Because more often you're going to update only one row and not multiple rows. So how do we identify the row? So this is the part where I suppose your ID or unique identifier becomes very useful. So if you're going to target only one row and not multiple rows, you need the ID. So the ID here for this particular row is ID value 3. So I'm going to say update product set the name to another regular cap, okay, where the ID is equal to 3. Now this condition here can be can also not just be a single ID identifier, it can be right your select statement when you have other criteria. But in a typical uh, database operation, where it's, especially you're doing updating of a certain row or certain uh, individual row, you will need to be very specific by specifying an ID like that. So let's say I run this. Now when you run a update statement, especially something that manipulates data, unlike the select statement, you don't get a result. Okay. But in Workbench, you can you can actually pull up uh, this is action uh, action output below. It tells you what statement you ran and what happened after that. <coughs> so in here, it tells you that one row affected uh, what's match and what's change. Okay, if the, if it doesn't work, it will give you a red cross uh, instead. So after I do this, it'd be best to select the row and see what changed. So as you can see, row ID number three has been modified. The name is modified to the new value and find so. So this is the update statement. Now can I change multiple uh, column names, right? If I need to change like three or four, do I need to repeat this whole thing all over again? You don't need to. The set statement allows you to, 
to also add multiple columns to assign values or change values from two. In order to do that, after a, a, the first column and value, I can put a comma, followed by the next column I want to modify. Maybe the price. So I say price, and I change it to 15. So if I want to modify additional columns in one single statement, update statement, all I need to do is add a comma and a next column name, and then the value on the one is overwrite with. So you can do this for multiple columns to do, to update, rather than run this statement like five times for five different columns. So you can do this again. Let's say this update and refresh the table. So my price now has changed to the new value that I defined in the statement. So essentially, this is how the update statement works in SQL. Operation, what, what you're going to do, update, what table, what colors to set, and then followed by the condition. So the next operation that I will go through will be the delete operation. So deleting Basically, what you're deleting is deleting a single row from the table. So coming back to products. Say I want to remove one of the rows here, okay, like this. The row number ID 9 and 10 are actually like duplicates. So one of them actually doesn't, one of them could be a mistake. So I want, I want to get rid of one of them. How do I do that? So in SQL, we've seen the select, update. Now to remove or delete a row, Literally, the command is delete. That's the keyword. So delete, you need to specify from which table again. So you notice the pattern. Select, update, delete. What operation followed by what table? Okay. Now in the delete, you just you don't you can't just write delete products. Okay. So for some reason, it look it looks like a select statement. You can say delete from which table. Okay. So delete from the products. Now, you don't need to say a set because you're not updating data. So instead of saying set, you need to specify a condition. So if you're targeting particular rows to remove, always specify the where condition followed by the criteria you want. Now, delete is very similar to update. When you're doing updates, you're doing, you're doing very row-specific updates. And deleting, you may be also doing, most of the time, doing very row-specific deletions. So here, we again, you will use the ID as a way to identify the row. So the same rule applies with delete compared to the update. If you don't specify the where condition, what happens is this statement itself will remove all the data from the table. So it's like dropping a bomb, everything will disappear. Please note also, most SQL databases or databases right, are persistent, uh, rather irreversible. So there's no control set or undo. Uh. So if you accidentally deleted data from the database server, the table, there's almost no way to recover it. Okay, so when you're running things like delete, you must be very careful. Okay. I would say impossible, but very hard. Lah. And then someone will get very mad at you. Okay. So if I want to remove products ID 9, okay, take away 9. So the, the context, the condition is uh, where ID is equal to 9. We do it remove like that. Okay, come back, refresh. And 9 is missing. Okay, is there any way to recover the row that I just deleted? Yes, for some databases. Uh, okay, so most databases today have this feature called transaction logs. Transaction logs will be logged whenever you make any changes to the database. SQL Server has it. So if you uh, actually accidentally deleted a row, you can ask your DB admin to recover the row with the transaction logs. But normally they won't want to do it uh, because it's very tedious. Okay. <clears throat> so whenever you're removing updating data, please be very, very careful because it's permanent. Okay. So this is a delete, delete the statement. Of course, the where condition here can, o can also be a combination of criteria, not just one criteria. The last important information, uh, last important SQL operation you need to know will be the insert statement. How do you add data back into the 
table. Like just now I just deleted the products, right? How do I add something back? So the keywords for adding something in any data or rows in the database or SQL Server, my or relation database, is to use the keyword called insert. So insert is literally insert a row. Now when you say insert, you need to of course say insert into what table? So into comes together with insert. So when you're inserting, you are inserting all the columns. You do not choose the columns you want to ins you do not choose the columns you want to insert into because when you put the information in, if you don't specify the column value, the database, depending on how that table is created, would put in its own values. Now the worst case is if the table doesn't actually define how that column's value default value is and you don't specify it, it will give you an error instead. So when you insert into products, you take account all the columns you're gonna put inside this uh, table itself. So if I'm, going, if I'm going to do an insertion into products, I need to almost literally specify all the columns, but except for a few exceptions. Now the insert command works like this. Basic general format, insert into the table, followed by the columns you're going to insert into. Now there are some exceptions to what columns you, what sort of columns you can insert data, followed by the keyword values and followed by the actual value you want to put in. Okay, so the order of the columns you specify in line 2 needs to coincide with the order of the values you specify in line 4. Meaning, if my first column here is name, right, and my second column here is going to be price, my values here should follow suit. If I do something like this, Love gun. Yeah. Okay. If I do something like this, that means I expect the DB to know what I'm talking about when I flip the thing on a cross purposely, right? I'll get an error, error message from the database server. <coughs> so the database server is not so smart. You will think you're going to put name, first element in the list here, or the top looks like a tuple. Huh? Then I should expect the first value here to be compatible to be put into name. Okay. So it has to be in the same order. That's rule number one. Rule number two, if you do not specify the column to insert, what happens in this case, let's say I only want interested in putting two information, name and price, but then purposely miss out everything else according to the products table. Now, SQL will first look at how the table is created. For every column, you will ask the question, is there a default value specified for the column? Now, if there's no default value specified for the column, then it will raise an exception telling you that this SQL statement cannot be cannot execute and therefore the row will not be inserted until you provide the values for that column. Now if there is a default value defined for the column, most of the time is this ID column or the unit or primary key. Then you can skip that column when you insert the value. So if I try to run this statement now, like this, okay. and pull out the, let's pull out the, the results here. So the last line in red, 22, that I want to highlight, I'm trying to insert the product's name and price. I don't care about everything else. It tells me, error code, there's an exception, few category ID doesn't have a default value. Okay, so the moment it finds a column that doesn't have a value, and I never actually put it in, it will complain, and it will just stop the execution of the SQL statement until I solve it. Okay. So sometimes when you're dealing with data, especially you're going to insert the, the, the row of data into this table. Now if you are the this database designer, you design a table, you are best to know which one you can insert, which one you can skip. Now if you're not, if someone made a table for you to put tables in, I think it's very wise to check what are the columns you must have values to put it in. Otherwise you might get some advanced errors like this. How do we check? Okay, with a GUI, it's fairly easy. You can just, for me, I just need to right click on the products and choose the author table command to see. Okay, but of course, they, there are other ways to do it in the command line. So let me pull this line down. Okay, so this is what the insights of this product table look like, or rather, I call the definition of the product table. So the column name here, data type, and couple options, all abbreviated. 
So notice the column ID here has a yellow key. You can see the yellow, the yellow key there. So this yellow key is what I mean by the primary key. All in, in your data frame, your index column, the unique column that identifies every row. So this ensures that every row has a uniquely identifiable value to it, almost like your NIC. Now the data tag here is an integer uh, up to a certain size. There are also various options that we checked here. Okay, so let's look at one of them, each option one by one. The PK here means primary key. So if we check, means it specifies that this column is a primary key. NN here means not now. That means that this column, the rule for this column is that it cannot contain a now value. There must always be a value inserted in the column. UQ is unique index. This not not mandatory to enable it. Binary column typically is for storing binary data. That means non-text, non-number data. Unsigned data type is when you're storing numbers that do not have a negative uh, value to it. The one important one I look when you look at is the AI. So AI is not artificial intelligence. It means auto increments. Auto increment means the database actually assigns a number or index to every row that goes in. So what it means to say that if the product table at the beginning contain, doesn't contain any row of data, the first row I put in will essentially start with the value one. So there's like an imaginary imaginary value of zero that it increases every time I put a value in. So the next row I put in the value the ID will become two, three, four. Now this auto increment by nature is increment by one. But you can have also in certain databases system right to skip the value and uh, maybe have a different step. So by default it's step, the value is one. Okay. Now for the rest of the values here, okay, notice that the default column here, so the default column here actually specify what's the default value for everything else. So for name as a default, price as a default now. Now coming down to here, category ID and owned by user. These two particular columns do not have a default, means no matter what, you need to specify values for this category ID and owned by user. So that, just the earlier, the error that came out was because of the category ID. Now, it didn't, ex it didn't give you the error of owned by user, because the moment you encounter the first error, you just stop there. Okay? So until maybe I you put the category ID and I miss out the owned by user, then I'll get another error with an exception message telling me that owned by user needs to have a value. So let me put in the category ID. And owned by user. <clears throat> So now I'm running the statement again. The last statement that was run is green, row affected one. So this means that if this statement, insert statement, has been successfully executed. So if I come back to one of my tabs, which I can refresh the table. So when I in, when you insert a row in the database in the table, always by default it appears at the end of it. It never gets put in the middle of the whole table. So here's my new row. The ID has also incremented. So just now when I started, the last ID was 14. So the new row inserted actually gets a new ID called 15. And 15 is also incremented from the previous number, 14. So if you notice that all the values of columns that never specify a value, they'll follow the rule of the default value aside that's set in the column. The like images was a noun, full description is a noun. So this noun here will be the same concept as your NAN. Whenever you read the data frame, and sometimes there are no, there's no information in that column missing. Then it shows an NAN. In the MSQL or SQL server situation, like in this case, I specify my default as now, it will appear as a now. Can I change the default values? Yes. So when you define a table, you can decide what kind of default values you want. It doesn't have to be a now, it can be an empty string. Empty string means a, a string without any characters inside. Or for numbers, it can be a zero or something else. So this is the insert. So, so far we've gone through the selection, 
updating, delete, and insert. The four basic data operations that you need to and you need to actually remember and use. So what else can you do in SQL here? Now there are two things here that has not been really covered yet. Creation of databases and creation of tables. So these four statements here, what we call them would be data manipulation. data manipulation statements. So there are two types of statements in SQL. One of them is called data manipulation, and the other is called data definition. So data manipulation is your everyday data bread and butter of SQL. You, do, you will use this every day, you deal with databases, don't stop. Data definition happens at the beginning of a data project, when you need to define your columns, the type of tables, and what data you want to store. So how do you, how do you write data definition uh, statements? Essentially, there are two data definition statements. The two data definition statements you need to know. One is the creation of a database schema, the other is the creation of tables. So in the creation of database schema, basically it looks like this. Create, da create database followed by the database name. So if you want to create a database in my NMySQL, all I need to write is just create. So create itself is a keyword followed by the database. Now because you can create not just a database, you create tables, you can create indexes. So there are a lot of things to create, so you need to specify what kind of data you want to create. So here I can essentially say I want to create a database call. virus <laughs> right <clears throat> uh, in the workbench you need to refresh on the left hand side panel to see the DB appear okay so I created a DB called with Wuhan virus and what I want to store in that inside there will be tables so maybe you want to track all the suspect cases in, that, that are coming through that have been discovered so the next thing I would, might want to create will be a table So creation of table allows you to do something like this. So when you create a table, you need to think about the table name and the column. So column will define what you want to store. So in this case, let's say I want to, before I create a table, create a so-called table first, I need to specify run this statement called use. Now what is this use take? What is this use the statement about? So the use statement here basically tells MySQL specifically which database schema I want to, I want to use it use for this particular query. Now if I don't specify this use command and I accidentally have selected another schema, in this case, right, whatever I do will affect the selected schema. So in Workbench, the selected schema is identified by the highlighting of the bold of the the, the name as well being bold. If you don't bold it, that means it's not bolded, right? That means that's not, that's not the active schema you're in. So when you're using Workbench, please make sure that you cited the correct schema to do your data operation on. Otherwise, you might accidentally run your statements on another database. Now, to avoid a situation, you if you have a, a, another um, schema, okay, but you especially want to run this on a new another uh, the schema you want to, so you can use you can use the use command. So the use command or keyword allows you to specify the database schema that you want to run subsequent queries on. So let's say I want to do this. So I will create a table called patients. Right? And I want to have, oh sorry. Bracket. So I want to decide the columns. So what are the columns I want? So the column format, how I define it will be column name followed by data type. Generally, it's like that. So maybe I will have things like a patient ID or int. Okay. So this is a basic column format. That means the name of the column followed by the type, the data type of the column that I want to use. Okay, how do you know what kind of data what kind of data types you can actually use in MISQL? Um, if you're using the workbench workbench here, you type yeah. 
you will try to prompt you with possible keywords. So if the intelligent sense in your mobile kicks in, it will actually show you what the possible matching keywords. Otherwise, you can actually specify, like in this case, how many uh, digits you can store, or the size of the data type. Other options here will be like in this case, notice the customer ID here has there as additional options. Not now, primary key, auto auto equipment. So this but this particular line here that's attached to the customer ID are your options or your checkboxes I show you in the table properties earlier in the GUI. So what it what this does is actually if I say I want my patient's ID to be not now, okay. Maybe I just made them the case. Huh? So first of all, cannot have now values. Next thing, this is a primary key. And then auto increment. Yeah. <coughs> and every time you insert a row, the ID will increase by one. So this whole bunch is one option, two option, three options put together. Okay. And then followed my by my other columns that were defined. Okay. In MISQL, I think the first few data types that you will be acquainted with will be things like integer. I just put integer. Bar char. Okay, bar char actually just means variable characters. So meaning first thing can store up to 255 characters or 150. The number inside is up to you to define it. But the maximum number in MISQL I think is 4000. Okay. There are also other very important um, data types also, but not just numbers, text, as well as dates. So you can also store date values inside the database. <clears throat> so there are different date values in the database. One of them is called a type uh, timestamp. Another type, let me see, do I have anything here? My <coughs> yeah. <coughs> data data time. Okay. <coughs> so these are the different date types you can data type date types you can use. Uh, MSL date time date time, timestamp or year. Okay. So basically you can store like just the date or you can just store the time or you can store a combination of both by saying date time or timestamp or you can just store the year. Um, between time, date time and timestamp. So what's, what's the difference, right? Timestamp. <clears throat> Now, data and handstand can include a fractional or trailing fractional second. So, they can store up to seconds. How many seconds? And more precise uh, time. Okay. Now, uh, what is timestamp? So, if you use timestamp between date time, the date time will be based on the local machine uh, time zone. If you use timestamp, it will convert it to UTC. What is UTC? UTC stands for Universal Time Conversion. Okay. So you all know about time zones, right? Certain countries are so many hours ahead of us, right? We are GMT, GMT plus eight. Okay. So that means you, if you use um, GMT, which means which mean time, I'm not, I'm not, I cannot fully explain why it's called that way. And there's also UTC or coordinated. Universal time uh, UTC. So universal time is a uni is a time value that can be agreed regardless of where you are. So here how do you get how do you get your local time right? Is you take your U UTC plus your time offset time zone. So if you're GMT plus eight right, basically you take your UTC plus eight hours. If your X number also you take the, the, the number of time plus the, the hours set. 
Now, the best way to store time is to store in UTC, Universal Time Format. And then you store the time zone where, uh, or you adjust the time zone according to your location. So that you it's the same no matter what. So in these things called time zones, um, there are a lot of ways to store time. There's also another way of storing time, which is to store the call the epoch. Okay, so the epoch in time zones is also another interesting topic. Okay. So instead of storing it like MSQL showing you, right, which is oh, year, month, day, hour, minute, second, fraction of a second, there's this thing called a unique time step. So for every equivalent time representation, there is equivalent unique timestamp represented in seconds. Meaning, <coughs> right now it's 7.54 p.m. The epoch is 15803852827 seconds. Okay. Seconds or milliseconds. Now, so why do we use this thing called seconds to store? Okay. Basically, it's a bit easier to do conversions, especially between, between different languages. But this is something that you might encounter if you're extracting data that has time, uh, has the timestamp stored in different formats. Okay, so in case you do come across a situation where how come your time, date time extracted looks like a number, no, doesn't come in the year, month, day format, then you, this is likely the reason why. Okay? So, <clears throat> Does anyone want to know why this is called epoch? Okay. You all heard of the Y2K problem, right? So the epoch basically was uh, supposedly a better way of storing time by saying that number of seconds since 1st of January 1970. Um, last time Y2K problem because they only used two, two digits to store the year, right? So I'm going to introduce you in your lifetime if you survive past two, the year 2038, another problem. It's not called the Y2K problem, it's called the year 2038 problem. So every system that uses an integer to store timestamp will eventually run out of value by year 2038. What time? First, 19 of January, 3 a.m. So by this time in the future, any system that any system that stores date date time using this using integers will reset to first of January 1970. So this is your second Y2K problem. If you leave past 2038, you will see this happen again. Okay, so we're going to come back to what I So let's say this is my system I want to set up. Okay, so let me just save it. So when you run the statement, and of course you need to refresh the site. Ta-da, your patience. So here is my patient's table in my Wuhan virus schema. So now I can track all the patients who got infected. <clears throat> okay. Uh, of course then, other than you have your insertion, insert, update, delete, those commands you've seen it already. Okay, cool. Now, when we're retrieving data, sometimes you need to do sorting, right? You don't, you may not just take it as it is. So let's come back to the product selection statement. So in this particular selection statement, I can select based on criteria, I can project columns that I want. How about if I need to sort it? In this case, I've actually selected messages from, from this message chat message table based on buy ID and some other conditions. But I want the table to be sorted in a date that was sent in ascending order. How do I do that? So one more keyword to add to your library is this order by. So the order by keyword allows you to 
only applicable for select statement. Okay, this one is not useful for the other three insert update delete. Okay, so I can specify order by which column I want. Now, because I'm retrieving, I'm projecting two columns, message and date sent. Perhaps I'm interested in ordering the data by date set in ascending order. So this what happened right now, I selected the different schema, so it doesn't exist. So let me change my schema by adding a use statement. Okay. So now this, this data that I retrieved from the chat messages is ordered by the date set in ascending order. Ascending order means earliest date first, latest date last. Now I want to see the latest information from the table based on the date that I put in descending order. This order by can apply to any columns as long as it is in your projection. You can also order by multiple columns, not just one, but many as many columns as you have based on your projection or you select. Okay. <clears throat> you all want a break now? Okay, do a 15 minutes break.